this is a very difficult time of year and it's the 10 year anniversary, obviously an anniversary you hoped you would never see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I never thought we'd still be in this situation so, so far along the, the, the line. Um, it's a huge amount of time and so in some ways it, it feels like it was only a few weeks ago and other times it's felt really long. Um, but it is a hard marker of time, I think. And you've referred to it on your website as stolen time. Well, yeah, I mean, it's time that we should have had with Madeline. We should have been a family of five for all that time. And yeah, it does feel stolen. And you could never have imagined 10 years ago that you would, you would still be in this situation. I think the situation is that we tried everything in our power to not have a long protracted missing person case like this. Um, it's devastating and you know, early on I threw myself into trying to do everything we could to help find her. Um, obviously that hasn't worked yet but you know we are still looking forward. I think that's the most important thing and there's still hope. And how are you doing as a family, the pair of you? I think we're in a, you know, a new normality really, uh, particularly over probably the last, seems like a long time saying it, but over the last five years since uh, the Metropolitan Police actually started their investigation, it's taken a huge pressure off us individually and as a family. And because before that you were trying to fight the case yourselves, trying to encourage the police to look for Madeleine, get yeah. the Portuguese police involved. Yeah, the, I think the key thing was, and I suppose the injustice of it, was that after the initial Portuguese investigation closed, essentially no one other than us was actually doing anything proactively to try and find Madeleine. And I think every parent could understand that what you want and what we have aspired to is to have all the reasonable lines of inquiry followed to a logical conclusion as far as you can do that. Uh, and that was incredibly frustrating. And uh, now you talked at the time about what a blow that was. It was terrible, I and mean, it's horrible. And you know, as much as we tried, and we're fortunate to have had so many donations into Madeline's fund and used that money to try and um, investigate, you, your hands are tied. You don't have the powers that law enforcement have. So, so yeah. how much of a difference has it made? So, for the last five years, the police have been actively investigating. Huge. Absolutely huge, and I can't emphasise enough just what a massive burden that's lifted from us and those around us, and and also knowing that the lines of investigation have been prosecuted. And I know the Assistant Commissioner, uh, Mr Rowley, spoke during the week, but uh, you know a lot of those lines have been taken to a conclusion, and that's as almost as important as you know finding. Um, who's actually responsible, but knowing that those lines have been shut down. Um, and the police have talked about one significant lead that they're still pursuing. Can you tell me anything about that? Well, we're very much, the investigation is in the hands of the Metropolitan Police. There clearly are ongoing inquiries, and, uh, and from our perspective, that's the important thing. Um, they've, man I mean, they've managed to pull so much together and sift through so much information. So now we do seem to be on just several lines of inquiry rather than tens, hundreds. Um, and there are four officers working on it full time. You know there have been criticisms that the, the, the police shouldn't be spending so much money still so many years on on this case. What would you say I to think them? Some of that criticism is really quite unfair actually because I know it's a single missing child but there are millions of British tourists that go to the Algarve um, year on year and essentially you've got a British subject uh, who's the subject of a crime and there were other crimes that came to light following Madeleine's abduction that involved British tourists. So I think prosecuting it um, to a reasonable end is what you would expect whether... But of course it doesn't happen, you know, there are, sadly there are so m many children that go missing and the resources are not deployed on their cases they have been on yours. You know, I think it's others within law enforcement have made it very clear this type of stranger abduction is exceptionally rare actually and we need to put it into perspective and it's partly why Madeline's case has attracted so much attention thrown in with many other ingredients but you know this type of abduction is exceptionally rare. 
the, one of the police officers in Portugal has been a thorn in your side for many years. He was thrown off the investigation, but then he wrote a book, he uh, presented a documentary, presenting a view of what happened to Madeleine, which implicates you. And you fought it through the courts. Mm -hmm. At the moment, you've lost and he has won. Is, is this the end for you now? Are you going to continue to, to, to fight him? Well, I think the short answer is we have to, because the, the last judgment, I think, is terrible. Um, so we will be appealing. Um, and we haven't lodged that yet, but it will be going to the European courts. Um, I think it's also important to say that when we lodged the action, uh, it was eight years ago, and the circumstances were very different, where we felt there was real damage being done to the search for Madeleine at that time, particularly in Portugal. Well, because he was effectively suggesting that, that you yeah. were involved in the I think, you know, what of people really need to realise, though, is, and, you know, uh, Assistant Commissioner Rowley has said it again this week, and the Portuguese have said it, and the final report have said it, is there's no evidence that Madeleine's dead. Um, and the prosecutor said, you know, there's no evidence that we were involved in any crime. And really, th that's saying anything opposite isn't justice. Uh, it's not justice for Madeleine. I mean, it's, I mean, I find it all incomprehensible, to be honest, and it has been very upsetting and it's caused a lot of frustration and anger, which is a real negative emotion. And I think we just need to channel that. And I just have to hope that in the long run that justice will prevail and yeah. all, all will be well. So. And it, I think it's also important, you know, for us personally, but for our rest of our family as well. For your children. Be, yeah, and our, our wider family, our own parents, and brothers and sisters, etc. So, you know, we've got to challenge it and uh, we will do. The other thing that struck me when I was looking through various internet search engines before I did this interview was quite how much cruel, distressing, horribly tasteless commentary there is out there about you, about Madeline, people giving their opinions about what they think happened, though even though they don't know you, they were nowhere near, they, they can't possibly know. How do you deal with that? Well, I think the whole social media, I mean, it's got huge pros, but huge cons. And um, I mean, on the downside, and all that's been written, we, I guess we protect ourselves, really. We, we don't go there, to be honest. We are, we are aware of things that get said um, because people alert, alert us to it. I guess our worry is for our children, really. Of course, um, because they're now 12, they're at an age where social media becomes increasingly important. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I don't want to dwell on, you know, the negative aspects too long, but I think in this era of fake news, it, it is extremely topical and I think people just need to think twice before what they write and the effects it has on it. And certainly, I know, ourselves with our own experience both in the mainstream media and also on the internet uh, we just I'm not going to believe that until I see evidence of it uh, convincing and you know what I'm sure there's a small very small minority of people who spend their time doing it but it's totally inhibited what we do personally we don't use social media although we have used it in Madeline's campaign but for our twins who are growing up in an era uh, where mobile technology is used all the time. We don't want them not to be able to use it the same way that their peers do. Um, so how, how do you protect them? Thing. I think the, the most important thing, and we had some excellent advice early on uh, with Kate, and is that we've been as open with them as we can. We've told them um, about things, <coughs> excuse me, and also you know that people are, are writing things that are simply just untrue and they need to be aware of that. Um, they're not really um, at the age um, where they are, you know, on the internet and other sites, but they're they coming to... Be. Yeah, they're coming to that stage and uh, they're in closed groups with their friends, etc. And, and that's important. I think we've tried yeah. to educate them a little bit as well, because obviously it's not just us that has fallen victim to of course not. the downside of social media. Yeah. And but does it, does it shock you? Because it, it shocked me, certainly a little, the things that people I say. I think it has been shocking, the whole kind of that aspect of human nature that I hadn't really encountered before. Um, and because I think it's so far from how you would behave or 
people that you know would behave. It's been striking um, and, and quite hard really to get your head around because why, why would somebody write that, you know? Why would somebody add to someone's upset? upset? Why would someone in a position of ignorance um, do something like that? But I think we're seeing the, you know, the worst and the best of human nature and experience and, and our personal experience rather than on the internet has been overwhelmingly seeing the better side of human nature. And I think we need to remember that actually. We've had fantastic support over the last 10 years and because there's a lot of media attention now around the 10th anniversary, we're starting to see that again. As I think well. it's true. I think because things like social media or mm. Amaral or whatever, because it's so, so awful and upsetting, it does kind of sometimes stand out more, so it becomes more, more of a talking point really, whereas actually the, you know, the, the main thing that we've experienced is the goodness of people and the support that we've had over mm. 10 years which hasn't wavered in all that time, you know, and that. How different is your life now to the life that, you know, when you have a child, you subconsciously imagine your, consciously or subconsciously imagine your future and the future of that child. I mean, how different is your life now to what you must have imagined all those years ago? Oh, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because it's such a long time, but. <coughs> yeah, I think before Madeline, was taken, we felt we'd managed to achieve a little perfect nuclear family of five. <clears throat> and we had that for a short period and um, I suppose you, it's just it's almost the same way as if your child becomes ill or seriously ill or, or has died and like many other families have suffered, um, then your vision is altered and you have to adapt. And I think that's a theme that speaking to other people who have gone through terribly traumatic processes with children and other loved ones, that is something that gradually happens and uh, you adapt and you have a new normality. And unfortunately for us, our new normality at the minute is a family of four. Um, but we have adapted and that's important. And as we've said about the investigation, the last five years in particular, it's allowed us to really properly devote time to looking after the twins and ourselves and, and of course carrying on with our work. Um, at some point you've got to realise that you know time is not frozen and um, I think both of us realised that we've owed it to the twins to make sure that their life is as uh, fulfilling as they deserve and we, we've certainly tried our best to achieve that. And, and, and certainly on the face of it, you appear to have stayed so strong as a family unit. I just wonder how you've managed to do that, how you've managed to, you know, it's so easy to blame each other when a cataclysm befalls a family. Mm -hmm. That's such an easy trap to fall into. Yeah. I don't think there's ever been any blame, fortunately. I think what people do say is you don't realise how strong you are until you have no option. And I think that's very true. Obviously, massive events like this um, cause a lot of reaction, a lot of trauma and upset but ultimately you have to keep going and especially when you've got other children involved and you know some of that is subconscious I think you your mind and body just take over to a certain extent but if you can't change something immediately you have to go with it and do the best that you can and I think that's all we've tried to do and as Jerry said I mean one of our goals, obviously ultimately finding Madeline, um, was to ensure that Sean and Emily have a very normal, happy and fulfilling life. And we'll do everything that we can to, to ensure that. And life for you has changed in, in different ways, Kate. I mean, you were, were a GP, you stopped working, you haven't gone back to full-time work. I mean, I assume the idea of someone else looking after your children seemed well, unthinkable after what happened you just needed to be with the children and be there? Well, certainly, initially, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the kids weren't even in school, so I wanted to be there. I didn't want to let them out my sight. Mm. There was obviously a lot going on, a lot of campaign work. There was a lot of emotion. Um, I am actually back at work now. Um, I'm doing something different to what I was doing. But um, What are you doing now? So I'm back into medicine, um, but a different area to not general practice. So that obviously takes up some time. And again, that was a, a big step as well to 
I get re-established in a, as normal a life as possible. Um, so, I mean, life's busy. I think in some ways, um, I don't know if it's our personality or whether it's a coping strategy, but sometimes it's almost a little bit too frenetic, but it, it keeps us going. You know, I think uh, we don't dwell too much on things unnecessarily. So I think there's probably a self-protective thing there as well, but we, we do have a very full life and as normal as, as we can make it. And how much do you, do you make Madeleine a part of it? And do you talk about Madeleine? Is she, is she a name that crops up every day? Yeah, I mean, it was, she's always still part of her life. Um, there's photographs all around the house. Um, obviously at this time of year, then uh, we can't <laughs> even have conversations that doesn't involve it. The kids know that we're doing an interview today. You know, the anniversary's coming up. Um, so she is still part of it, but obviously... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think every kind of event that we do, whether it be a birthday or a family occasion or even an achievement or something, I mean, that, that's kind of when you really feel her absence. Um, it's slightly different to how it was in the early days when everything we were doing was, was to find Madeline, whereas now we are having to get on and live a life as well. But it's not that any day um, she's not there, if you know what I mean. Um, and last time we talked, you told me how you were still buying birthday presents and Christmas presents for Madeline. Are you, with 10 yeah, years still, now, are you still, still doing do that. that? I still do that, yeah. And that, so you go around not. the shops and you think Madeline would be this age now, um, what would she want? And that's it. So, I mean, I obviously have to um, think about what age she is and something that, um, you know, whenever we find her, um, will still be appropriate. So there's a lot of, a lot of thought goes into it, but I couldn't not, you know, she's still our daughter. She'll always be our daughter. It's because Kate does all the present buying. I always do the present <laughs> buying. <laughs> you know, and yeah, there'll be another one coming up in, you know, next few weeks, so. And Madeline would be how old? She's coming now? up to 14. To 14. And this anniversary, how will you get through that day? Well, I think like I, I put in my message on the website, every day is another day without Madeline. Um, I think it's just that number, it's that 10 year mark which makes it more significant I think because it's a reminder of how much time has gone by and obviously 10 is a big number. I think we'll get by as, as we have any other year really, we'll be surrounded by family and friends, you know, obviously we'll be there remembering Madeline as we always have. And I think that the, the day and the poignancy of it that we don't tend to go back to the time because it's so draining, mm. but inevitably on the anniversaries and on our birthday, they are the, by far the hardest days, by far. I think it is important yeah. though, because despite how difficult these days are, just keeping in mind actually how much progress we have made. Mm. And you know, it, nothing's ever going to be quick enough from, from our point of view, but I mean, as you know, the last five years, we've come a long way. And there is progress. Um, there are some very credible lines of inquiry that the police are working on. And whilst there's no evidence to, to give us any negative news, you know, that hope is still there. And so it really is there in your hearts? Yeah. The hope that so one day yeah, I, I mean, you'll I, be reunited with your daughter? Yeah, well, no parent's going to give up on their child unless they know for certain their child's dead. And that we just don't have any evidence. So my you've hope got to of Madeline being out there is no less than it was almost 10 years ago. I mean, apart from those first 48 hours, nothing actually has changed since then. I mean, our, I think the difficult thing has always been, how will we find her? You know, because you're relying on the police doing everything they can, and you're relying on somebody with information coming forward. I think that that's so important that everyone thinks, well, what could have happened? But some of the scenarios with other people who have been abducted and kept, they're just so unbelievable that you think, that, how, how could that have happened? And that's probably what's going to happen with Madeline's case as well, that people go, it's incredible how that 
I think and Mark we just don't Rowley know. underlined that last week, the ACC, because he said... That from the Metropolitan Police? Yeah, you, you can't apply normal logic to someone who commits a crime like this. Because you try and think, well, surely if it had done that, they'd have done that, and therefore... But you can't. Because but you must also look at cases like the case of Ben Needham, you know, who, who went missing in mm. Greece decades mm. past. Well, it is interesting, though, that yeah, you know, the people who've got the most experience are the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children in the US. And one of the earliest things that stuck with me ever since then is the younger, at the time a child is taken, the more likely they've been taken to be kept. And that could equally apply to Ben Needham, who was younger than Madeline. So that, that's something, you know, that we have to factor in, actually. Which in one way could be a relief, but in another way is an unconscionable thought for you. Of course, and it is, and it's 10 years, and how much you changed, and where should we be now? Um, so, but I mean, I think the key thing is to find Madeline. Um, she either needs to, if she's still alive, recognise that who she is, or we need to find the, the person or, or people responsible for taking her. And you must have imagined over the years, if you saw her, you know, what you'd say to her, how your lives would change. Yeah, I, tr I think I try not to, to go there too often, to be honest. It's one of those real bittersweet kind of thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine, i say 10 years is a long time, but ultimately, we're a mum and dad, and she's our daughter, and she's got brother and sister, grandparents, and lots of family and friends, you know. Um, so it would be absolutely fine, you know. It would be, well, I'm sure it's beyond we'll words, really. <laughs> sure we'll, we'll cope we'll with cope. anything, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I know that doing this interview is something you thought long and hard about. It's not something you particularly want to do, certainly not something you're looking forward to. What do you hope by doing an interview like this? What do you hope uh, that people will hear? What's the message you want to get out? I think, you know, that there is still hope, really. Um, there isn't a new appeal. Uh, most of the media that we've done in the previous years is usually around that. So this uh, is unusual. So we are marking the anniversary. Um, I think it's been good for the general public to hear the police say that there's no evidence that she's dead and that there's an active investigation and there's still hope. So certainly from my point of view, you know, somebody knows what's happened. And I think, you know, we've had so many supporters who are, say, are still with us, people that we don't know are still there. And I guess I just want them to be re reassured that, that there is progress being made. And, you know, it might not be as quick as we want, but there's, there's real progress being made. So I think we need to take heart from that. And we just have to, to go with the process and follow it through, whatever it takes, for as long as it takes. You know, but there's still hope that we can find Madeline. And if you do find Madeline, you will be able to show her oh. everything you did to try and find her. Absolutely. So you never gave up. I guess for her, just knowing how many people have been there willing a home. Mm really important.